there is a correlation between wealth on these tests. Those factors are much more multifaceted than just, oh, the test favors rich kids, the test favors white kids. No, we need to look at the underlying factors as to why that's the case. Because you know what else fa favors rich and white kids? GPA, uh, extracurriculars, um, postgraduate employment, so many indicators of success, right? And I, and I use, you know, success in quotes because there's lots of ways to finding success also correlate with those same factors. So at that point, we need to stop pretending that it's just the tests that are the problem because ultimately it's a lot more multifaceted and, and uh, that's what kind of keeps me up at night when I think about the education system. Hello and welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show, an interview podcast where my friend Lewis and I explore different industries by talking to entrepreneurs, investors, thought leaders, and people living high leverage lives. They're out there, they're playing the game, they're doing really cool stuff, and we are extracting insights from our conversations with these people and sharing them with you, the person that is listening to this podcast. Whoever the hell you are, that's for sure. We can't put a face to you. It's crazy. Podcasting's so interesting. Our interesting thought leader, entrepreneur, investor, I don't know if he's an investor, in this episode is Grant McCarty. I was going to introduce him and say Grant's a friend of ours, but the podcast was actually the first time that Kyle met Grant formally, uh, but he is a friend of mine, and now Kyle can probably call him a friend after the fact. Grant is extremely interesting, which is kind of a barrier to entry for most of our podcasts, I guess, and a redundant thing to say at this point, but he graduated from the University of Alabama in like two years. He took 33 credits a semester. It's insane. He'll tell that story in this podcast. He's a baseball player at Johns Hopkins where he's getting his MBA. He's like still, I don't even know if he's 21 yet, maybe barely 21. He is the founder of a really awesome educational test prep company called Prep HQ, which provides extremely affordable test prep to students from underprivileged communities that would previously be priced out of test prep. In doing that, he's helped students accept over $15 million in scholarship money. And in addition to all of that, he also is the founder of McYoung Consulting, where he helps companies with their marketing and anything else that he might be able to help them with. This conversation explores how Grant got into all of these different things, how he organizes his day, how he's so effective, how he's so much energy, and you're going to learn a lot from listening to him and hopefully be a little bit inspired to go do some cool stuff yourself. With all that, I'm going to switch to the episode now. Enjoy. Grant, welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show. Fun to bring you on after knowing you for almost a year now, probably actually a bit over a year. Uh, so welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's good to see you again, Lewis. Kyle, this is the first time uh, we're officially meeting. But uh, yeah, I've, I've been listening for a lot longer than, uh, than I think a lot of people. So um, maybe, I don't know, pretty proud of that. Well, we appreciate that a lot. And we're glad that someone like you finds our podcast interesting and useful and educational. First question right off the bat, why did you choose Alabama? What was the motivation for going there? And then how did you graduate so damn quickly? Oh, all right. Uh, kind of a loaded question. Um, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack here. There is, I, uh, we can, we can go through whatever you want to go through here. Uh, the, the long story short is, um, I didn't get into some of the top, top colleges I was looking for. And there's a big reason for that, which I don't know if you guys know this. Um, I actually got expelled from my high school. Um, well, let's start there because my that's interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, all right. The The best way I've found to describe uh, that whole experience was uh, I ran essentially what was like an underground homework ring um, at my high school. Uh, not proud of it necessarily. It definitely spiraled out of control, but... Um, yeah, I was at a private Catholic high school. It's a, it's a really well-known Catholic high school. Um, it has a lot of uh, athletes that go on to be professional athletes, that go on to be um, really you know top college athletes, that kind of deal. And there are a lot of kids who have a lot of money who are willing to pay to get their work done. And uh, I was 13 when I started high school. Um, I was really young, really stupid, and uh, made some bad decisions and ultimately it got a lot bigger than I ever thought it would. And uh, I'm pretty open about it now. I'll, I'll tell people about it now. I'm, it's obviously not something I'm proud of, but I learned a bunch from it. And uh, yeah, I was expelled my sophomore year of high school, but it's really been, uh, in my mind, a pretty solid trajectory from there. So, wait okay. a second. How did you start <laughs> high school as a 13 year old? Um, let's see, I, I skipped a grade, um, like first, second grade. 
Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, and and then I was just young anyway. My birthday is like uh, end of December, it's uh, December thirty first. So I was just kind of young already, and then had moved ahead a year. Okay, so Grant McCarty, the the uh, expelled kid, just can't <laughs> making his way through life, ends up at Alabama because they accept him. Is that how that? So <laughs> sort of, sort of. So so the the idea was this: is I was uh, I was going to play baseball at MIT. Mm -hmm. um, got full support from the coaches, uh, everything got through, you know, most of the application process. And then, uh, finally, you know, um, come acceptance day, uh, I'm ultimately deferred, waitlisted, and then denied because, uh, academic honesty is something they take, you know, very seriously. So there I am, you know, I, I still had some very good options around, uh, you know, the April, May point of college admissions, but I'm sitting there kind of scrambling because all of my top choices just, I didn't get in. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that was despite, uh, you know, I was, I was a pretty good student. I mean, I had like above a 4.0, I had perfect test scores. I mean, like, like I, I tried to do all the right things, but, uh, like I said, um, getting expelled kind of haunts you, uh, during that process. So ultimately, um, I ended up at Alabama The the best way to, to, to explain why is just, uh, they gave me a lot of money. They, they gave me a lot of money. Um, and I actually didn't even visit the school. I uh, looked at the scholarship package. I f found Roll Tide on, on Google. I said, that sounds cool. And then I clicked accept. Okay. Now let's go to the next part of the story. <laughs> uh, there's there's a lot there. Where did you finish high school? Um, yeah, I went to a public school, uh, Silverado High School. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, Lewis, because you're, you're from Las Vegas. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you're you're familiar with with where I went to school. Uh, I don't know if I should say the first name of the school. I don't know I if they really to like that. From the clues. Uh, yeah, yeah. But. Um, if you're from Las Vegas, if you know a, a football school in Las Vegas, it's probably uh, the, the school that I'm talking about. Private, a private. Yeah, there's pretty much one. So. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so you go to Alabama because they give you money, and we'll get into when you said perfect test scores. That's mm. he's speaking literally there for the people who aren't necessarily familiar with Grant's backstory, background. Uh, you have perfect test scores. Alabama gives you a lot of money. How do you finish in like two years? <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'm a I'm a planner, right? There's a great you know Eisenhower quote, and, and I'm going to butcher it here, but it's essentially um, you know planning like plans are useless but plans are everything right so the idea that you might create a plan um and you have to accept and know that you're probably not you're going to deviate from that plan multiple times but if you don't ever create that plan in the first place then you won't be prepared when you have to deviate from it so uh when i started college or before you know that summer i went through all these different scenarios of how i could graduate uh in three years four years uh triple majoring Right. I, I was I was declared triple major my freshman year um, and I was like, all right, I'll do that in three years and then I'll get a master's or something. I think a bunch of people, when you're going in your freshman year of college, you feel like you want to fit in all these degrees. You want to get your master's, your MBA. You want to go to law school, med school as quickly as you can. And I uh, had all those plans figured out. Um, and ultimately, what ended up happening was I went through actually a pretty normal freshman year. I think I took like 40 credits or something my freshman year. I had some AP classes and I actually injured my arm. Um, I, I play baseball, right? And so the plan was actually to walk on the Alabama baseball team. Uh, I injured my arm and I had to get Tommy John surgery, uh, which would have put me out for the entire next year. And I was looking at my situation and I go, all right, I'm probably not gonna play at Alabama. Even if I was healthy, pro like they're an SEC school, top 25 in the country, probably not gonna play there. Uh, what are my options here? Right. And so I started looking, can I, should I transfer? Should I try to go play in grad school somewhere else? What should I do? Um, do I, how long is it going to take me to graduate? And I was looking around and I looked at my degree works, which is where we figure out how long it'll take until we graduate. And I saw that I had 66 credits left and it just hit me. I was like, 66 credits. I could do that. <laughs> and so uh, I started looking at grad schools. I, um, I applied, I took the LSAT, I applied for law schools, I applied for master's in public policy programs, master's in international relations programs, MBA programs, uh, and ultimately, I just, my sophomore year, I kind of put my head down and realized 66 credits, all right, um, I can take some of those online, I can take various 
uh, you can take CLEP credits, right, where you can test out of them. But my second semester of my senior year, <laughs> I guess, sophomore year, uh, I took, you know, 33 credits. I took 11 classes. What was your major? Yeah, uh, I majored in history and political science. So I didn't take a single history of poli sci class in college. So I have no context if that as to how hard that is, but sounds hard. It's just like a ton of papers, just like every day. It, yeah. So the best way I can explain it, you know, I, I get a lot of STEM people who are like, "How did you do that?" There's no way, and that's the thing. I'm I'm not amazing at, at math. If you had given me 120 credits worth of like P sets, you know, problem sets and and computer science, you know, problems, things like that. Yeah, I probably wouldn't have graduated in two years. But here's the thing: I can, I can read a lot. Uh, I can read fairly quickly, and I can write a lot, and I can write fairly quickly. Um, so ultimately, m my sophomore year, my second year, I was basically writing two papers a week and reading the equivalent of about a book a week, whether that was an actual physical book um, for class or uh, you know research papers, which are a little more dense. Um, but ultimately, that. That's hard for some people. It's de it definitely wasn't easy, but it was more just it took a lot of time and it took a lot of late nights. I'll say that. I guess I'm kind of running the risk of getting a, a, a normie answer in that, you know, you just work hard. But like you you also have businesses on the side. You're, you're working on all these different things. You've, you've got this volunteer prep HQ company, and that's just one of the many other things that you're doing at the same time that you're taking 33 credit hours. And so like you know, how did you do it? I guess. I mean, that isn't even, I guess you just have a super high capacity for work. Would you say that that's a component of it or, or what do you think it is? That's a big component of it for sure. But I'll also say this, I think my college experience, I came into it, uh, very deliberately, right. In the sense of, I kind of viewed college from the start as this is, this is real world light. Right. If you fail here, it's not the end of the world. So what I wanted to do was put myself in positions for possible failure so that I could test my limits. And so what I did is, you know, if you were to look at my uh, degree works and, and look at my resume by semester, you'll see that each semester kind of tacked on more, whether that was more classes, um, more volunteer opportunities, you know, prep HQ my sophomore year. Uh, and ultimately, I viewed college as essentially this this playground to test my limits. And so I got serious about time blocking my freshman year. I actually, I wasn't, um, I did a lot of cool things in high school. I'm proud of my high school experience, but I wasn't the most disciplined kid in high school. Uh, I would procrastinate early on in my high school career that got better as I, you know, got older. But in college, I realized if I'm going to do a lot of these things that I want to do, I've got to be a lot more deliberate with my time. And I think the other thing as well is I didn't want to be that person who only did school or only did school and, and extracurriculars. Like I wanted to be able to go out with friends. I wanted to be able to um, go to parties, you know, go like I joined a fraternity my freshman year, which we can get into that as well. I mean, that that is, <laughs> I don't know, good and many bad things, uh, you know, uh, being in a fraternity to Alabama. But the point is, I didn't really sacrifice a lot of the parts of the college experience that I think a lot of people assume I did. And if I had to point out why, I'd say getting really good at time blocking my freshman year. And then I think the thing about time blocking that's really helpful is once you get really good at time blocking, you don't need it as much, right? Once you're able to say, I've got these 10 things I need to do today and I need to do them before this, you know, five o'clock. Once you've time blocked for so long, um, ultimately, eventually you just get disciplined enough to do those things before five o'clock. Um, that's not to say I was perfect. I definitely pulled some all-nighters, uh, some because I had to, some because I did it to myself. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, high capacity for work, I think, is the other thing. During the, during the pandemic, right, that's when I did my final semester of school and I was taking those 11 classes. And I know a lot of people struggled, right? Uh, and I, I don't want to discount that fact. I'll say because my classes were largely reading uh, and writing based, not much changed for my classes, right? Um, the, the modality of learning was really similar for me because I was getting most of my learning from a lecture, talking to a professor on Zoom, reading and writing. So 
yeah, it, it, did I kind of lock myself in a room for 12 hours a day? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did that last semester, but that left 12 other hours of the day. And uh, here's the final thing I will say, and this, this is the cautionary part. Um, I didn't sleep a lot. I probably averaged, you know, four hours of sleep per night my entire college career, which is like not healthy at all. And I'm not glorifying that. I don't want this to be mistaken as glorifying hustle culture. But I'll say that there are, you can look at life as maybe like a pie chart. I know some people have, have kind of uh, done it like that. You know, there's 100% of this pie chart and there are X number of factors in that pie chart. And if you want to do more with one of those factors, you have to sacrifice less. And so if you want to work more, if you want to study more, right, you might have to sacrifice your social life a little bit. You might have to sacrifice your sleep, your mental health, whatever it is. Uh, ultimately, sleep was the big one that I chose to sacrifice at the point where I could kind of maximize everything else. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. I mean, I think that that's, um, you know, a very nuanced answer and is what I was expecting. And it was not the, uh, you know, the classic, it's just, it's just the way I am, uh, sort of thing. So, uh, you know, you're a deliberate person, you're intentional, you decide to get your MBA. Um, I would say in the face of a, a lot of the people, the, um, the culture that I listen to is saying that MBAs are declining in value. Why did you intentionally, deliberately make that decision? And uh, I guess, what was the calculus that went into it? Yeah, so a couple things, right? I had the opportunity at that point, like I said, to go to some really great law schools, international relations programs, right? These other programs that uh, ultimately might be better suited, maybe even for me or, or for a lot of people. But I think I was looking at this and I was graduating college. I was 19 years old, right? And I was looking at what is, what is the average timeline? Let's say I do go to law school. What's that going to look like? Okay, I'm done with law school at 22. One, are people going to hire a 22-year-old lawyer? Maybe not. Also, though, I don't know. I, I'm still willing to bet on myself, right? So I, I wasn't necessarily worried about the age thing as much as when you go into law school, a lot of times you get funneled into a certain kind of rat race, right? You get funneled into big law. You get funneled into a clerkship. You get funneled into these things. And I was looking at my life and, and especially around the time that Prep HQ was actually turning into something. And I realized if I go down some of these routes, I'm going to be severely limiting my freedom and some of my creative options, right? If you go into big law and you work for a big law firm right out of uh, law school, you're working 80, 90, 100 hour weeks of really grueling work. And it's not glorified work. You're reading case law and you're writing a lot. You're not in the courtroom, you know, making these amazing impassioned speeches. You're not doing that, right? And so I realized, is that what I want? And even if it is what I want, is that what I want right now at, at 19? And so ultimately, I was very lucky to get acceptances from various schools. And uh, I realized around that time that an MBA, to your point, you know, yeah, there is a declining value of an MBA. I think too many people get their MBA out of undergrad, which is hilarious because I did that. So I know it's like, do as I say, not as I do. I think I looked at my situation and my narrative for my MBA application was I started this company, Prep HQ. I think I'm doing a lot of things okay. I know that there's a lot of things I'm not doing super well. I would love to get the support of an MBA network to learn how to run a business from people who have done it before and be in an environment where that will be supported, right? And, and that will be directly engaged. And so I realized that an MBA was probably a really good place for me. However, uh, I was in a position to, I ultimately chose Johns Hopkins University for my MBA. I was in a position to choose some other schools, but I think it came down to money for me as well. Uh, just like my undergrad op opportunity did. I got incredibly lucky. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, I got uh, the Cary Business Fellowship, which is, it's a full ride to um, the business school and then a really generous stipend on top of that. So they bet on me, they believed in me, and I felt like I had to reward that with, you know, betting on, on Cary and betting on that opportunity. And ultimately, despite an MBA having declining value, like you said, I think a lot of that 
comes down to what you're doing with it. If you're going to an MBA just because it's the next step on your path or because you've heard that you'll be successful if you get an MBA, that's not the right way to do it. I think you should have a very deliberate reason why you're going to an MBA, especially if you're going to spend $120,000, $140,000 to do it. And I think if you know why you're getting an MBA, if you know the types of companies you want to recruit for, if you make a you know deliberate effort to network, to meet people, that money will pay for itself. But if you go in and you're not quite certain, and especially if you're young and you don't have work experience, I've been working in various ways you know, since I was, I don't know, 12 or 13. I've been finding ways to make money ever, uh, as, as you could imagine from my high school experience. Uh, you know, ever since that time. So I wanted to be in a position where that was supported and would allow me to develop. And a lot of other types of academic programs probably wouldn't do that for me. Did sports factor into anything? Are you playing baseball there? Oh yeah, I completely forgot about that. Yeah, so I reached out to uh, a lot of schools and um, basically the idea was if I wanted to play at like an Ivy League school, you had to transfer as an undergrad. So I was like, I'm not doing that. So. Uh, it left a specific number of schools that lined up academically and baseball wise, right? Uh, some of the schools that I would love to go to academically, I'm just not good enough to play there baseball wise, right? Vanderbilt, how cool would, it, would that have been to go there for grad school? I'm not playing that Vanderbilt baseball, right? Uh, so I, I ended up choosing Johns Hopkins. I got recruited by their baseball team. Uh, I still have eligibility left because they're division three. You can still play as a graduate student. You're your clock, so to speak, right? Uh, I've still got years of eligibility. So it worked out really nicely. Yeah, I was injured last year, as I mentioned, but uh, the plan is to play this season and actually the fall season starts in a, uh, in a few weeks. Are you conditioned? You ready to play? Yeah, I've been uh, in rehab after my uh, Tommy John surgery in August of 2020 for like over a year. I'm back on the mound, uh, still working my way to 100%, but I feel good. Uh, I'm in the best shape of my life for sure. And I've just got to kind of wait for my arm to get there. That's you're an interesting guy, Grant. Um, you know, I think <laughs> you keep saying you got lucky. I think luck is like a lever in, in every domain and everybody has luck that's applied to them. I think a lot of this is, um, is deterministic and determined by your, you know, deliberate actions. And so I just wanted to say that. And then, in terms of the MBA and, and your uh, response, I think that like everything is just broken down to the m the most individual level. Like it, it's really about you. It's about what you do at your MBA program that makes it whether or not it's valuable. Um, exactly. But I think you know we're kind of skirting around this big topic that's been a part of your life for years, which is prep prep prep, prep HQ. HQ, right, Lewis? So. Let's, um, I guess, start at the beginning and, and tell us why you care about it, why it's good for people, and, and what your plans are for it. Sure. Yeah, so Prep HQ, for those of you who don't know, which is a lot of people, you know, uh, and, there, and there's no shame in that. Uh, Prep HQ is a company I started a few years back, uh, and it's dedicated to helping high school students get into college and learn how to pay for it. I do a lot of work with students in underprivileged uh, communities because those are often the students that don't have the same access to test prep, to college admissions, to even just equitable education. And when, you know, to go back to the start of why I started Prep HQ, I have to go back a few years before, uh, ultimately in high school, when I had gotten those test scores and done really well and everything, I ended up getting hired by uh, a test prep company. And I worked my way up through that company and was ultimately uh, helped that company expand nationally to do, um, you know, some some classes, right, with some students. And I'd done a bunch of one on one tutoring. And the thing about this company is I think it's a great company. I, I really do. I love the owner. I love the people working the company. But with a lot of companies in test prep, they end up making the same concession, which is this. You start off wanting to help maybe people who can't afford it or making it accessible to everyone. And then you realize it's really hard to make those unit economics work. And you ultimately end up helping the students in private schools, the, the parents who are paying the thousands of dollars, the, the Catholic schools, the Lutheran schools, the, um, all of those types of students. 
And there's nothing wrong with helping those types of students. They're paying for it. You're providing a service. There's nothing wrong with that. But it hit me one day because in Las Vegas, when I would do private tutoring, I would go to the houses of students and I would drive to their homes. And I lived in Henderson. For, so if you're not familiar with Las Vegas, there are a couple different areas. But, uh, you know, there's Henderson. Um, there's, you know, Las Vegas kind of proper things like that. And then there's Summerlin, which is up north. And there are other areas of, of Las Vegas, but I think Henderson is kind of older suburbs of Las Vegas. Summerlin is, there's a lot of newer money in Summerlin, and it's a very well-off part of Las Vegas. And almost all of my clients were in Summerlin. <laughs> and it was interesting because the high school I went to, Silverado High School, is actually a Title I high school, which means that every single student is eligible or uh, gets free lunch. Because once you get a certain percentage of free reduced lunch at your schools, uh, they become Title I. So I went to a school where there was a large percentage of students who didn't have a lot of money. Uh, I have seven siblings, right? I, I'm very grateful for my parents. Um, they, they definitely have done well, but I don't care how much money you make. Uh, when you have eight kids to take care of, that money goes fast. And so we didn't have the thousands of dollars to spend on test prep. We didn't have those things. And ultimately, I realized the students I was working with at the first test prep company were not the students who needed my help the most, right? I, was, <laughs> I realized one day I was working with a kid, and, and the kid's a, ni a nice kid. I'm sure he's doing fine now. But I was looking around and looking at his house, this million-dollar mansion, right? I had to drive through a gate to get to his house and then drive through another gate and drive about two minutes just to get to his house, right? So it was a double-gated neighborhood. And I just realized this kid's going to be just fine without me, <laughs> right? Uh, even if I wasn't here, he would find another tutor from Kaplan. He would be just fine without me. Even if he didn't get prep, he would be just fine. And that's not the reality for millions and millions of students in the United States. So what that led me to do was figure out how can I expand access to test prep to as many students as possible. And because of that, I started Prep HQ. And the way that I've been able to do that is I teach 20 hour long weekend camps that go over everything a student needs to know to get into college, starting with, you know, how to ace their standardized tests. But then I go that step further because a lot of these students just acing their tests isn't enough. They need help with college admissions. They need to figure out where to get scholarships. They don't know where to start. And so I try to eliminate them on that process, guide them through that process. And I'm actually, I'm really proud to say this thing that I love the most about the program is any student who's eligible for free reduced lunch when I do, uh, camps through schools, uh, they attend the camp for free. So students who are paying for it subsidize the students who aren't, and even the students who are paying for it are paying uh, less than half of what they would pay with major test prep companies. So how did you solve for the unit economics problem? Yeah, uh, this is where I guess marketing comes in and understanding how do you reach your customer? Who is your target customer? And what I realized is every single test prep company or just about every single test prep company, they've made a concession of working with richer students and richer families because those economics are easier. It doesn't mean they're impossible to do it the other way. It just means it's a lot easier to get 10 students paying $3,000 than it is to get 100 students paying $300. So the marketing question is, how do I get in front of as many possible paying parents and possible paying students as possible uh, in order to make this work. And that's where working with the schools is the real game changer. If you can get the schools to market your camps for you, uh, it becomes a lot easier than just running a paid ad on Facebook or anything of that nature. And there are other ways to do this as well. And this is actually an area Prep HQ is currently expanding to, which is partnering with community organizations, partnering with sports teams, high school sports teams, uh, club sports teams. The key is how do you get in front of as many parents as possible? Because it's not that they don't want this. It's that they don't even know it's out there. Mm -hmm. They don't know that they can do this affordably. They know that Kaplan costs $3,000 and they don't look any further. So when you can get a trusted, uh, it's essentially the idea of like influencer marketing, right? When you get someone that you know, like, and trust who tells you, hey, try out this product, you're probably going to try out that product. And I realized in the education space, who are those people that parents know, like, and trust? It's counselors at schools, it's principals at schools, it's sports coaches, it's these people who have direct contact with parents 
that parents already trust, not some sleazy test prep company who's saying, hey, buy my $2,000 service or even me where I'm able to say, hey, buy my service. It's, it's affordable. I, I care about the students, all these things. Parents are still inherently distrustful uh, anytime money comes into uh, the equation with education, especially if they're not conditioned like some more wealthy families to already be paying for tutoring and test prep services. Um, could you quantify that inequality between, because I mean, I know, you know, some statistics, I've seen some graphs of like test scores between um, high income and low income families, but I'm sure that you know the statistics off your head, off the top of your head. So if you could shed some light on that, I think it could provide some color to, to the, the organization, the service that you provided. Yeah. So it, it's almost a direct correlation of income to test scores, right? So you, you can actually, if you look up SAT test scores versus income, you'll find a graph on like the first or second thing of Google, uh, result of Google, and it's almost a straight line just like this of if your family makes more money, you are likely to do better on these tests. And one thing I want to clarify is this, is there are a lot of reasons for that, right? Um, it is not just, I, I think there's a tendency to call these tests racist um, because uh, white students and Asian students predominantly like perform much better than the national average and almost every other minority group in the United States performs worse than the national average. There's a real problem with that. I just want to clarify the problems are not just with the tests. In my opinion, the problems are not the tests. I think the problems are the structural factors that make that in inequity in the first place, that inequality in the first place. Um, what, what I mean is that income is ultimately the biggest cor you know, correlation to test scores. Why is that? Well, because your parents, if, you, if they have a high income, they're much more likely to have had uh, you know, higher education levels. They're much more likely to stress education in the household. They do have access to test prep and, and expensive services. Uh, they're more likely to maybe have a connection that can help you get an internship in high school or in college, right? There are all these things that wealth correlates to. Mm. And I, I just want to make it clear that like the problem is not with the tests per se. The problem is with the 12 years of schooling before the kids take the test, the, the societal conditions that they grow up in that make it so that they're not scoring as well by the time they're in 11th or 12th grade. And I, I hear it a lot. I hear a lot of, uh, you know, just arguments against these tests. And I don't love the SAT or the ACT. I don't, uh, I don't wake up every day and go, man, I, I love the SAT. That, that's not why I do this. But I recognize that there's a need for standardization in, in college admissions. And if we try to use the test as a scapegoat, we ignore the underlying factors in education that lead to some of these problems, which are underfunded schools, which are teacher retention. Lewis, you know this, 900 open teacher spots in Clark County, Las Vegas, right? Las Vegas, Nevada has 900 open teacher spots. What do you do there, right? And, and what schools have those open teacher spots, right? It's not the private Lutheran schools, it's not. So I know that was a little bit of a tangent, but I just wanna be clear, there is a correlation between wealth on these tests those factors are much more multifaceted than just, oh, the test favors rich kids, the test favors white kids. No, we need to look at the underlying factors as to why that's the case. Because you know what else fa favors rich and white kids? GPA, uh, extracurriculars, um, postgraduate employment. So many indicators of success, right? And I, and I use you know success in quotes because there's lots of ways defining success also correlate with those same factors. So at that point, we need to stop pretending that it's just the tests that are the problem, because ultimately it's a lot more multifaceted. And, and uh, that's what kind of keeps me up at night when I think about the education system. So let's get a good sense on where you are with the business. So like how many camps have you run? Like roughly how many kids have come through it? What are some outcomes? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I've run a few dozen camps. I don't have the exact number. Uh, I've worked with over 1,500 students at this point. I think the, the key outcomes are this, is our average student improves four points on the ACT and 150 points on the SAT. Uh, that correlates to about a 23 percentage percentile increase, uh, which is ultimately we're able to quantify that when looking at scholarships uh, to colleges as worth possibly tens of thousands of dollars, depending on the, the college you go to. 
Uh, our students have received over $15 million in scholarships uh, over the past few years. And that's actually closer to like 17.5 million after this last cycle, because we just had students get amazing scholarships from uh, one student got a full ride to USC, uh, University of Southern California, plus a stipend. Another student got a full ride. Uh, multiple students got full rides to University of Alabama as in-state in -state students. We got students who go to Ivy League schools and just by getting into an Ivy League school, if your parents aren't making a certain amount of money, some of those schools will just meet your need 100%, right? So if you, go to, if you get into Harvard and you're making less than like, I think it's 70 or $80,000, your parents are, boom, 100% scholarship to Harvard. That is worth $300,000, right? There's no other way to spin that. So you can see how those numbers start adding up uh, when you put these really smart, talented kids in opportunities to, to succeed that they haven't had in the past. So one question I have, because I've seen that number on your website and a lot of uh, education test prep companies and not to in interrogate it. So if I am a kid and I apply to five schools and I get $100,000 <laughs> from each school, is that $500,000 of scholarship offers or $100,000? Because if 100. you have one kid who sends out 25 applicants, you know, that one kid could get 15 million bucks, <laughs> quote unquote. So yeah. just to break down the number and make sure you're reporting it. And I'm understanding the way you're reporting it. Yeah, I'm actually really glad you asked that because I'm sure that a lot of people are wondering that. And uh, no, so we use it by the, the scholarship that the student ultimately accepts, right? Wow. And so because of that, right, so $15, it's 15 million. million in accepted scholarships. Yes, yeah. So we've had students, you're exactly right, get millions of dollars in scholarships that are offered. But why would I say this student got $3 million in scholarships when they only accepted 100,000 of it? Okay, so that is the lowest way you can honestly, yeah, so you could, if you're dishonest, right, you could inflate that number probably about 100x uh, because <laughs> yeah. everyone gets offered like 20 things, uh, but they only take, you know, the opportunity cost is, yeah, okay, just making sure. And now, once again, I'm, I'm glad you asked, but yeah, I, I, I'm not in this business to scam people. If I was in the business to scam people, I would have, uh, you know, started my own crypto. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. That, that, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, if I was in the business to scam people, I wouldn't be in education. I think it's as simple as that. If, if people ever question, uh, you know, my or anybody else's motivation in education, I guess my response is just like, why would we be in education? There are so many other industries that you can make a lot more money in. That, and you can make a lot more money a lot more quickly. Uh, I think most people in education, I'm inclined to believe, maybe I'm a, a little naive, but uh, I'm inclined to believe that they're, they're doing this for the right reasons. So what are you hoping to do next steps with the company? And I wasn't obviously making any accusations. I was just, that's the one number that I wanted to understand the reporting methodology. Uh, but what are next steps for Prep HQ? And it's not just you, right? You have a team, you have tutors. Yeah, Where's so there's the going this year, five years. Great question. So over the next year or two, like I said, we're going to be expanding to that uh, sports vertical. And this is kind of the first time I've publicly mentioned it. But ultimately, we want to start. Uh, we want to start expanding into different verticals, offering different variations of our flagship camp. So um, we're going to be offering a, a test prep camp specifically geared toward high school athletes who want to play college baseball. <laughs> Uh, college baseball is a specifically uh, pretty unique um, sport to try to play college uh, college athletics in. And the reason why is because there are 35 roster spots in the Division I college baseball program and only 11.7 scholarships. So this isn't like football where everybody gets a full ride if they get a scholarship. It's not like basketball. Um, you have to divide 11.7 scholarships across 27 players and then eight players can't get any scholarships. So what that means is college baseball, you can imagine the kids who are going to schools and as walk-ons, they're not necessarily the kids from maybe the, the lower income backgrounds because they have to pay full pay, right? So what I'm trying to help students do is let's get you academic money so that you can play college baseball at the schools that you want to go play at, play at. So that's a vertical. Um, in terms of uh, next steps for Prep HQ from a, a longer time horizon, it's continuing this model of... I view it as essentially a self-sustaining nonprofit, right? We offer services, not because I'm trying to make a bunch of money in test prep, but because the more money we make, the more students we can help for free. So we're expanding our partnerships, uh, hopefully with um, more colleges. 
uh, over the next few years. We're uh, partnering with some nonprofits around the country. Um, there's one nonprofit, uh, especially that I want to shout out. It's called School on Wheels. It's in Los Angeles. Um, they work with over 900 students in LA who are uh, homeless. And we're partnering with them in order to help those students figure out, hey, college is an option for you and we can make this work even if at every other point in your life, maybe that hasn't been signaled to you. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna be working on kind of expanding our touch points with students. The, the camp is great. The camp is successful, it does a lot of things, but here's the thing. If you just go to a camp and your score improves and then you never think about college again or, uh, until college admissions time, or you never think about the test again or career uh, until you have to, we're not maximizing our impact on students and we're not doing the best service that we can for students. So we've been in the process of building an app called Prep HQ Connect, which the point is to have established and dedicated mentors to continue the touch points with the students after the camp so that the mentors can check in and make sure, hey, um, do you have any questions about college? Do you need help figuring out scholarships? Uh, do you need help comparing your financial aid options, right? We're not obviously financial advisors or anything of that sort, but being able to help a student, even just with a few questions they have throughout the process for free after they've been at the camp, I think that's really gonna maximize the returns uh, on somebody's kind of investment in education through Prep HQ. I love that. Um, I think it's an incredible mission and it is very important. Um, you know, I go into it further, but I think that this is an interesting question. So if you had uninhibited power to make one policy change um, around education, what do you think would be the highest leverage thing to produce um, the the uh, highest delta, I guess, in like quality of life of th like the entire um, low income population of students. It's it's a great question, and I do really quickly before I get a bunch of angry messages or emails after this. I do need to recognize right the role of federalism in the United States and recognizing that like you can make a national policy change in education. Oftentimes, that doesn't go over well with like. 40 of the 50 states. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, certain districts can make their own rules, states can make their own rules. And that's one of the big reasons actually for just educational disparity across states, across communities. It's just really hard to standardize this stuff. I think a big one, and, and it gets harped on so much, but I think because of that, we've almost forgotten how big of an impact this could make. Just expanding teacher pay, right? Uh, teacher retention is such a big issue. If you have two or three teachers in a school year, what does that signal to you as a student about how much people care about you and your future, right? If they're just leaving, right? There's, here's the thing. When you're a kid, you draw weird conclusions. That's the reality. You draw conclusions from things that maybe are outside of your control that maybe don't actually mean that. But one thing that's a big issue with young kids, especially young kids from low income backgrounds, kids from backgrounds where maybe both their parents aren't in the house, right? Things like that. There's like severe abandonment issues with education. Um, and just in general, people feel like no one believes in them. How many stories have you heard of successful business people, of, of musical artists, of, of just all these successful people who say, my teacher said I could never do it. Mm -hmm. And, and I prove them wrong. I hear that every day. <laughs> That's a problem when we have teachers just telling kids that they can't do it, what, what they want. Um, why does that happen? Because teachers are overworked and underpaid because people who are passionate about education don't go into education. They just go take a job with a company that's going to pay them three times as much and let them work less, right? The, our, the best and brightest people in the United States are not going into education. And the people who do go into education are, have, are having to make severe sacrifices. Teachers are having to pay for supplies out of their own pocket, right? Um, the turnover rate for teachers and the turnover rate for teachers, especially in low-income communities, is, is unreal. And once again, I don't want to generalize because it's different across communities, but I think paying teachers more and incentivizing people to get into education and stay in education in the ways that we do with like, for example, loan forgiveness when you go into uh, public service, things like that. Um, I think that would ultimately make becoming a teacher a better investment in you know economically and quality of life. Uh, and the impact on education, on the economy, here's the last thing I'll say, when people say we can't afford it. We can't afford 
not to improve our education. Do yourself a favor, and I'm not going to throw out numbers because I don't know the exact numbers. Do yourself a favor and look at the economic impact of poor education in the United States. And you'll see that it totals billions and billions of dollars every year in terms of uh, increased incarceration, um, increased uh, welfare benefits and, and other subsidies, right? When you don't have an educated population that can subsist, uh, uh, you know, support themselves, that leads to crime. That leads to, uh, you know, people not getting good jobs and, and having to rely on the government. So a lot of these people who say, we don't want to spend more on education because we can't afford it. We can't afford what we're doing now. So I would say that and then just general, general, uh, um, I know you asked for one thing, but I think this goes hand in hand, just general, uh, I would say more equitable funding of schools. I'm not a fan of just throwing money at schools saying that'll solve the problem because that isn't the answer. But what is, you know, what is also not the answer is schools having textbooks from like 2003. What's also not the answer is, uh, you know, um, schools in Texas having textbooks that still use the phrase like uh, war of northern aggression, right? Like torn apart textbooks, um, teachers who can't afford supplies, schools and administration who are overworked. That's just not going to do it. So I would say put more money into education, but make sure that money is going toward the right places. Make sure it is going to those things that are going to have maximum ROI. And I would say if there's one place, I think it would be it would be teacher pay at low income schools. Yeah. Um, no, I love it. I think, um, I, there's this, there's this graph that Ray Dalio posted about the downfall of, um, empires. It's not a graph. It's like a, you know, eight chapter thing on LinkedIn. Um, and one really stood out to me and it was about the, the spending of empires over time and like the very first line that jumps up and I'm not going to explain this well, but basically it's like amount of money spent on the Y axis and time on the X axis. And then it's like, you've got, uh, defense as one line, education as one line, um, you know, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, education is the first line that just absolutely skyrockets. Every, they start spending tons of money on education and then everything else follows. It's like you, you spend all this money on education and then you have an empire for a hundred years. And mm -hmm. throughout that time of prosperity, the amount of money that you spend on, on education proportionally declines uh, like, you know, a lot. And, and mm -hmm. that ultimately leads to the d downfall of that empire. And so, um, that's happened historically. And I think that we're watching it happen with the United States. Um, I think that um, that's absolutely right. Well, one more thing, because I think it's an incredible point, and I'll, I'll keep this short, but it's uh, look at the history of the U.S. and look at the history of innovation in the U.S. and education in the U.S. During the late 1800s and the, and the 1900s, the U.S. was at the forefront of educational innovation. The U.S. was at the forefront of educational spending of make, making sure our literacy rates were the highest in the world, right? Because we invested in education. The U.S., in large part, got to where we were because we invested in education, because we invested in innovation and in, in all these different things. And I think to your point, there's some complacency. Once you reach the top, you feel like you've done enough. But in order to stay at the top, you have to continually invest and reinvest. And I think one of our big failures has been investing in the communities that maybe historically uh, <laughs> we haven't really been investing in anyway. So I, I think it's a great point. And I, I would just challenge or encourage anybody to look at the history of the U.S. and look at how education played in a role, uh, a role in the U.S. becoming a world hegemon. And I think it's going to be pretty outsized compared to what you might think. Yeah. Um, so this is an off topic question and something that I want to talk to you about generally. So um, marketing to me, I, I just I don't really understand what it is. I know that sounds dumb, but like what is marketing and no, and why do you like it or, or, or why are you good at it or like what skills do you think that you've acquired that have made you capable of of marketing great question and it's not a dumb question it, it's something that i think i struggle with as a marketer uh working with companies who maybe don't understand the importance of marketing or don't understand how it works or what goes into it i think the best way I can describe marketing is you're figuring out what your consumers want, 
you're figuring out the language they use, and you're doing your best to deliver an effective message so that you can give them what they want or what they need, right? Uh, I think that's marketing at its best when you are giving somebody some, uh, what they need, right? And that was the challenge with Prep HQ was I know I have something that helps people. I know I have something that people have claimed that they want. How do I get this message in front of the right people? How do I make sure that that message is as effective as possible in order to further my mission? So that's really where it started throughout my, my own uh, journey. And I also think marketing is something anybody can learn. I think there are some gatekeepers in the marketing world saying, you have to have an innate understanding of human psychology and, and not everybody can learn those things. Go, you can major. They don't stop anybody from majoring in psychology in college because they're not capable of learning it, right? Um, marketing is, is the intersection of psychology, of business, of consumer wants and needs, of microeconomics. I think it's fascinating. And I think one of the reasons I'm drawn to marketing is because good marketing can do more than just make a company money. Good marketing could have really helped the United States uh, when we were trying to, um, and, and I, this is apolitical, I'm not making a stance on this, I'm saying if the US wanted to increase vaccination rates, better marketing certainly could have helped. If they wanted to increase masking, better marketing really could have helped, right? And something like that shows me the power of marketing, the power of messaging. And I think there are a lot of people who use the phrase controlling the narrative, and I think good marketing allows you to control the narrative. And if what you're doing is good, um, and obviously that's hard to, to really figure out, each person has to figure out if what they're doing is good, but I think that's powerful for me. If I have a, a vision, um, a goal that is good, how can I maximize the number of people who are going to see that in the same way that I do? So I think marketing allows you to control the narrative. Uh, it plays an outsized impact on companies on governments and I think a lot of companies fail not because their product isn't good not because their idea isn't good but because their marketing isn't good and once I realized that I realized it was a playground for me to build skills to get better at this and work with a lot of companies who are doing really cool things and just not really getting in front of the people that they want that's a great great way to think about it and there's a great book I recommend anyone read on marketing called traction and like the tagline of that book is literally just most startups don't fail to build a good product they fail to get traction yep it's like the graveyard is because of marketing 99 percent of the time exactly and it's and i think one thing in the marketing world that's difficult is you got a lot of people because of the rise of digital marketing who have learned some of these skills and they're and maybe they're not amazing at a lot of aspects of marketing. So there are actually a lot of companies that realize, hey, marketing is important. Let me go hire a freelancer. Let me go hire an agency. This is a mistake I made at, at the, the start of Prep HQ, and I've made it multiple times. A lot of people say that they can do really great things in marketing. Not everybody can follow through with that. So I think some people can get really bad taste in their mouth when they pay a company thousands of dollars for marketing and the company comes back and says, we made you this, uh, like, you know, we changed your font on your website and uh, you know, here's a branding guide, right? Those things can be extremely helpful in the right cases, but I think companies are looking for return on investment whenever they spend money and marketing sometimes might not have a return on investment. One of my keys with marketing is I want to show companies that return on investment. So I try to go after the most high impact kind of low hanging fruit in marketing so that companies can essentially get those quick wins, realize, oh man, marketing is super important. And then maybe if you want to do things down the road that won't have as direct of a return on investment, that can be really beneficial as well. But if that's the first thing you're doing for a company's marketing, you're not going to sell someone on marketing. You're going to make them hate marketing and think that it's a made up, you know, uh, kind of a, a made up, what's the word, job. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like a quasi-science or exactly know, something, some, a quackery. So, you know, I, I mean, I kind of understand exactly. marketing. I just there are a lot of quacks in marketing. You, that question that way, but the way that uh, Wes Ko describes it in one of our podcast episodes early on, as this like spectrum between performance marketing and brand marketing, and like you know performance marketing is where you can prove prove your results. Like I did this ad, here is exactly how much ROAS or, or money I made you, and then brand marketing is like those longer term plays that you're talking about where. 
uh, you know, you crash 100 R8s in Iron Man and 10 years later, Audi is like a, a worldwide superpower or whatever. It's like you you can't quantify yeah. exactly what went into um, Audi doing this or, or becoming this much bigger company. But for certain, you know, those Iron Man movies didn't hurt. And it's like what you're saying, I think, is that if you go to the brand marketing side of the um, spectrum too fast or you start there and you can't prove your results, maybe, um, you know, you, you get seen as a sleaze bag because you're not doing anything that you lose right. buy-in. Huh? Yeah, for sure. And I think from a company's perspective, it's not wrong of them to want to focus on profit first. I think, in fact, a lot of startups would be benefit would be uh, benefited by focusing on profit more than brand recognition, more than growth and a lot of these other metrics, because as we've seen, there are just countless examples of companies that have prioritized some of these things and then realized, oh, shoot, we can't make the business model work. We can't make money here. And so I would actually, you know, I, I think for me, where I'm interested uh, in, in the marketing space is how can I help you make money faster? How can I help you prove product market fit? How can I help you reach your target customer so that you can sell to them? Uh, I'm less interested, and there are some incredible people who work in branding and work in advertising in some of these spaces, uh, but ultimately, you do need a larger budget, you need a longer time frame, uh, you need more burn rate um, if you're going to be focusing on some of those things, and that's not to say they're not valuable. I would definitely just say that most companies, especially bootstrap companies, uh, especially early stage startups, they need to focus on making money, and when you burn hundreds of thousands of dollars on branding, uh, for the hope that it's going to pay off five years down the road, your company might not exist in five years. So it's that balance. You're exactly right of doing both and making sure that your company is still around so that you can see the results of, you know, the, the branding side of things that you've put in. So we're coming up towards the end here, just of, of time. Uh, so I'll ask you a few quick questions. One I have is we've, you know, gone easy on you in the sense that we've given you the soapbox for a lot of topics. You've spent a lot of time thinking about but what is something that you've learned in the last week that's interesting? Wow, great question. In the last week, yeah. So one of the things I've learned in the last week, uh, I recently you know, started uh, a Twitter account, right? I've been on tech Twitter. I've been on startup Twitter. I think one of the things I've learned in the last week is that uh, information flow is vastly different and it's constantly changing, uh, but it's vastly different than it's ever been in human history in the sense that we have more information than ever, and maybe this isn't a novel idea, but I think it, it's really been uh, highlighted for me over the past week. We have more information than ever. How much of that information is good information? How much of it is novel information? How much of it are, are we actually going to do something with? And one of the things that clicked with me was this, is 100 years ago, we wrote books. 20 years ago, we started writing blogs. Now, we write Twitter threads. And I'm not saying that those things can't be valuable. I'm saying that you all read, right? You know the value of a good book, right? You know the value of reading a couple of good blog posts a day. What is the value of reading 200 Twitter threads a day? I don't know, right? So I would say what I've learned in the past week is that the quality of the information you consume is ultimately the most important driving factor of really success, I would say, in my life. But also I would say in general, I think we could all do a better job of uh, – kind of improving the quality of information that we consume. Uh, and, and so the, the thing I've learned is that uh, it doesn't feel good to take in a lot of information if that information is not good. I don't find myself at the end of the day feeling like I've learned a lot. I find myself, man, I just wasted two hours reading a bunch of thoughts that were recycled um, that didn't really do a lot for me. So I, I would say I've learned that curating your information pipeline, making sure that information is high quality, whether that's improving the, the quality of people you follow or reading books that have been recommended to you multiple times, whatever it is. We have a finite amount of time on this planet. There's an infinite number of things that you could do with that time. Maximize the value of the things that you're doing with that limited time. Are you that probably wasn't uh, the perfect now? answer to your question. Uh, <laughs> am I prioritizing sleep? No, that's answer is perfect. Uh, thank you for, for that one. And then two, am I prioritizing sleep? Yeah, I am. So, I, uh, one of the big things is I, I didn't reach burnout in the typical sense. I reached burnout in the physical sense of, I got really 
uh, into working out again and realize that like when you're working out, sleep is a component of working out. Recovery is a huge component of working out. And if you're pushing yourself to physical limits and you're getting like three hours of sleep a night, uh, your body doesn't respond well. Let me just tell you that, right? And it leads to obviously fatigue and things like that. But something is like memory. My memory was was uh, you know not as sharp as it was. My communication skills. It was I, I had more delay in like how I would process information. And I was seeing those things in real time, uh, in part because I was pushing myself to physical limits um, that I maybe hadn't been pushing myself to before when I was getting way less sleep. It's good that you're acting on the information. Who was your favorite baseball player growing up? My favorite baseball player was Dustin Pedroia. He was the second baseman for the Red Sox. Uh, he won Rookie of the Year his freshman year, MVP the next year, or freshman year, excuse me, his rookie year, and then MVP the next year. He's five foot seven. I met him in person. He's like five five. All right, um, and he's one of those players that you know when you're look, when you're a kid, you're like, wow, if he can do it, anybody can, right? It's inspiring to watch, and I think that's. What, what I love about baseball so much is you have guys like Dustin Pedroia. He wasn't in great shape. He was about five foot five, five foot six, but he was an incredible, you know, defensive second baseman. And somehow he was able to hit like 20 home runs a year, even though everybody on his team was bigger than him. Everybody was stronger than him, faster than him. And it just kind of shows through sheer force of will, there are extraneous factors in your life that you can't control. But if you control the things in your life, that you can control your effort and your attitude uh more often than not i would say it's going to pay off not as much the case in basketball it's a lot tougher in basketball a lot tougher yeah spud webb or like some of these five foot guys they've they are anomalies uh and it's also that's the thing in baseball you can be the most physically gifted person in the world if you don't have the skills you're not going to play in basketball if you're seven feet you will get a contract somewhere mm -hmm. Like, like just by sheer physicality, you will play somewhere. So it's just interesting how that works. If you had, if you were interviewing David Zell for a podcast, what would be, a, would what, you do well, it? first of all, should we bring David Zell on the podcast? And second, if we do, which I'm not a fan of doing, uh, what question <laughs> would you ask him? Oh, all right. I think you should have David on the podcast. Yeah, I think you've been an interesting guest. He would probably spew just as much as me, which I don't know. Uh, you can decide whether that's a good or bad thing. Uh, if you were to ask him one question, uh, I would ask him. <laughs> maybe you wouldn't want me to say this. I don't know. I ask him about how he. Ask him about his framework for viewing success in the world. Right. I think this is something that we all struggle with. Uh, we all work through. We've got to figure out what is a meaningful life? What does success look like for me? And I think it'd be really interesting to get David's perspective on what a meaningful life is. And to be honest, I don't know the answer, which is why I'm really curious in, uh, um, in you all asking him that. Well, cut to. But if we ask him on Twitter, <laughs> we won't get a high quality answer. We have to ask him IRL because in Twitter, we just get, you know, the stream of consciousness. Uh, 280 characters so, well for sure uh, for sure um, this has been very enjoyable it sounds like you have one more thing to say which is totally cool go for uh, it. oh i was i was just gonna say yeah i uh i don't know if you had more questions to ask i i've never uh, done a podcast before i don't really know if i was supposed to give five minute answers to a you know six word question uh <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely open those aren't the, to... those aren't the ratios we compute we focus, we focus yeah. on quality of information. Gotcha. It's sort of like, you know, uh, it's about the, the quality of the information that you consume um, and, and how that uh, <laughs> impacts, like, people's lives. I mean, if it's five minutes of quality, right. it's five minutes so, of quality, you know? The time's less important. I, I, I think you're yeah, great. Well, I, I think our, our guests or our listeners will, too. And so I'm excited to release this one, and we're thankful to you for coming on the podcast. Uh, if someone's listening to this and they're like, damn, this guy's cool. I'm trying to graduate college in two years and start a bunch of companies. Where should we send them to find you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you my email. Um, <laughs> and and uh, you can follow me on Twitter. It's Grant underscore McCarty, uh, M-C-C-A-R-T-Y. But if you want to like reach out to me directly, Grant at theprephq.com, reach out to me. Uh, 
follow me on LinkedIn. I don't know. I respond to people. I think it's really important to, to give back. Not that I've like done a bunch of, like, I'm not in this crazy position to necessarily do that. But what I can give is like my time, and my information. So yeah, if anybody wants to reach out, even just to chat, but uh, if you need help with something, if you want to learn more about something, or you just want to, um, you know, tell me that you disagree with me, reach out. I'll, I'll engage. I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of that. Grant has reached out to me on my newsletter to tell me that he's disagreed with me a couple times. And it's lots of productive dialogues. So, I'm a big happens. fan of dialogue. That's how uh, that's how change happens, right? When we when we ignore you know things that maybe we're not fans of, then you know nothing changes. That's not good for anybody. And the last thing I'll say on that is, um, yeah, I don't view argumentation as like necessarily confrontation in a, in a negative. I don't have a negative connotation with those things. I think I can talk and or I can argue about things, I can converse about things without it getting personal because I think at the end of the day, it's in search for, you know, truth, whatever that means, uh, in search for, uh, in search of becoming a better person and living a better life. And so uh, anytime, you know, you want to talk about anything, it's not going to be from a necessarily super personal perspective of maybe looking down on anybody or any perspective. Um, because a lot of times I've been proven wrong or I've changed my perspective. So it's really from a sense of a uh, perspective of trying to learn and trying to be better. On that note, we'll wrap things up. Solid episode, everyone. Thanks, Grant. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. And that wraps up our conversation with Grant. It was really cool to meet him uh, through this podcast. You know, I've been hearing about him for a, a couple of years now, and uh, I've always just admired him from afar as being someone who's extremely intelligent, and he proved that out uh, <laughs> by a mile on this podcast. Uh, so my three takeaways, the first is one thing that I think it might be a direct quote, but um, failing to plan is planning to fail, and how important the process of planning can be in uh, achieving really anything, even though uh, when you're when you're out there and you're doing the thing, the plan pretty much doesn't matter because you know things change when you're when you're actually there you get punched in the face like things change fast and you you have to adapt but if you don't have the plan um you're planning to fail my second thing is um just you know when i asked him like how does he do it his first answer off the top is time blocking and I, we kind of skipped over i don't think we talked about it that much but like you know lewis and i have have talked about it on the podcast before and it's not something that I've adopted in my life. And obviously I need to, because the things that he's been able to accomplish are incredible. And, you know, I, I see the value in it. I just haven't done it. So this is me saying that I'm going to do it. There we go. Uh, and then my third thing is his explanation of marketing. I found really interesting because of one specific thing he said, which was marketing is finding and communicating um, with your customer in the way that they communicate. And so like finding their language and delivering the message in a language that they understand is what's more important than, you know, you like looking cool. What you need to do is find your customer and talk to them as if you're their friend, because that's what you're trying to do. And so I, I really enjoyed that takeaway on marketing and uh, overall just, you know, had a great time on this on this episode because Grant's super cool and inspiring. Absolutely. My first takeaway is time blocking as well. I got my time block right here for those of you on the YouTube to see uh, I'm roughly on schedule for today. Again, that goes back to your takeaway, right? I'm roughly on schedule. I made a plan. How well am I following that plan? I don't know, but I'm a lot further off than I would be had I had no plan. But yeah, we asked Grant a couple of questions. How do you do everything? He's like, well, I look at the time I have and I look at the stuff I'm going to do and I decide when I'm going to do it and then I do it more or less at that time. That is like extremely simple. That's one kind of meta theme that we have on the podcast, right? A lot of the stuff, simple, not easy to do, uh, but it's simple. It's difficult to have the discipline to follow through with what's on your schedule when you're in the mood to do something else, right? You're like, you don't want to do your workout right now, but this is the best time of day to do it. So you're going to do it. That's the hard part, but writing the schedule, that's like very, very simple advice. I explained it in a sentence and I'm taking too much time to explain it. My second takeaway is being very deliberate about your education. So I think this is something that we cover a lot is a lot of nuance around decisions. Like, should I drop out of college? Should I go to college? Should I go to a prestigious school? Should I go to grad school? Like, these are a lot of questions that have come up on a lot of various podcasts and Grant's answer 
is to be deliberate about the education that you're getting. So like, why are you going to undergrad? Like what, it, what is it you're hoping to get out of it? Are you going just to go? Cause that's a very different decision than going because for him, I think it was, he had a good scholarship and like, he didn't, you know, there's some professional goal he had that he wanted to do it, right? He wanted to keep playing baseball. So that's a lot of the reason why he's in grad school. And he, the point is he's just deliberate about the education that he's getting. So it's not just doing things just for the sake of doing something. Uh, that's often better than doing nothing, but it's, if you're like, just have reasons for doing the things you're doing and school, what might make sense for one person might not make sense for another person. Then the third takeaway is high quality information. So Grant in the past, in the weeks leading up to the podcast decided he was going to put himself on Twitter and quickly realized what that does to your brain, which is makes you think in short form, 140 character thoughts, instead of thinking like long form ideas that take pages and pages of a book to think. Uh, so when you're consuming really crap information, like let's call it mainstream news, you're going to be thinking in like very reactive jumping to conclusions. Like it's okay to have a, like have what is in your head, a fully baked opinion, even though you only have 30 seconds of information versus if all you consume are wait, but why articles or like Nassim Taleb books or like actual literal textbooks, which are very dense and packed and like have all of the nuance included, you're going to think in a deeper way. So the quality of your information dictates the quality of your thoughts. Another simple thing to understand difficult to implement because textbooks are less entertaining than Twitter. Hopefully podcasts fall somewhere in that happy medium. Uh, if you find that they're a good source of information, which in my opinion, they are, especially if you're doing something good with your time, like the dishes or going for a run or doing some stretching. Uh, the Lewis and Kyle show has a lot more episodes. This is somewhere in the eighties. We've got about 70. That didn't make any sense. We've got about 80 other episodes, depending on the math. They're pretty much all evergreen. So you go listen to any of those. They, they don't get dated with time and they get actually better. The, the Lewis and Kyle find wine show. I'd encourage you if you enjoyed this episode to listen to a previous one. And if you want to show some support, the best way to do that would be to reach out to us directly on social media. Tell us what you think or leave a rating or review on iTunes. That's it for this week. See you in a week or so with the next one. Bye-bye.